Okay, welcome back uh, to class. Um, the last class we did talk about uh, how do we make a choice of marrying someone. We spoke about the four areas of compatibility and we also uh, you know, got an in-depth about what are some of the warning signs that we may need to look into. I think Kennedy has raised a question here. Uh, are there types of marriage marriages uh, yes, how or where can we classify eloping types of marriages? Um, Kennedy, would you like to um, um, probably put to me as to what you meant by types of marriages? Yeah, what I'm inquiring, eh? Yes, what is the... we... Pardon? Yes, go ahead, Kennedy. Yeah, what I'm inquiring, there are people who are in polygamous marriages and there are people who okay. get into marriage through eloping. How do you, are those kinds of classifications or their types or how would you treat eloping? Is it in your culture? Because you see marriage to be a cultural issue. Okay. So, uh, okay, so I think you've, you've spoken about two, it's polygamy as well as marriage via eloping. Uh, so is it in our culture? Now, that's a good question because, you know, especially in India, there are, there are many, uh, many, many small little mini cultures here. But however, let me just tell you what scripture says. In scripture, there is just one marriage that's defined between one man, one woman only uh, before God. And that's how we define marriage. Um, also, can we, where do we classify eloping? Now the 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 concern I think or the uh, thought when when we're looking at eloping is to people deciding to walk away from uh, a setup that has been instituted because of certain reasons uh, of unacceptance and uh, so. Now, now, these are my thoughts, okay? So how I'd see eloping would be um, moving away to get married on your own choice, maybe on your own terms, um, without completely trusting that the Lord will bring this in a position of marriage. Um, so uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm trying to think of... so. Uh, specific. I, I, let me say maybe in our culture. So uh, there are there are times or there are examples that I can think of where there is a believer young man and a believer woman, or maybe one of them n has not come from a Christian background or a believing background, and is from another culture or another religion, and uh, having opposing parents or family who does not. Um, accept the union. So in a system like that, um, the recommendations I personally would give is, is number one, to do the best that you can to get help, to seek the support from the family because you may be in the Lord, but maybe your family isn't in the Lord, and as a result, it can be uh, it can be difficult. So getting people involved to to speak or to intervene in the situation could be one. The second is getting help from spiritual leaders, spiritual mentors on the best way to go forward. The, I know of couples who waited for many years. Till they have had the um, consent from the key significant people in their lives because of the due respect and the love that they wanted to show in wanting the family to be part of their, um, uh, their marriage. Uh, the third one, uh, of course, is deciding against um, what has, uh, you know, what maybe the parents have felt and going ahead. Um, but and I think one of the things about classifying in, in eloping, it is 
doing things maybe in secret and uh, that is that i believe is something you know we need to be truthful and honest and open about and uh, i think even having courage to being willing to uh, you know maybe move out of the home because they don't they don't agree with your uh, the the person you've um, uh, chosen because they are in the lord if that is the one of the primary reasons it it is to be done with as much of uh, a poise and as much of patience uh, uh not um um you know snipping off the important relationships especially those that are parental so uh in my understanding you know eloping probably is something that 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 is not a not a very healthy uh mode but something that i think it can be worked out better by by time in patience in in a lot more of uh help and support through the leaders uh, around i don't know would anyone else have any other thoughts i'd be interested to hear if uh, someone else has any other thoughts that was not considered in the answer anyone i'm sure some people have some thoughts yes sam go ahead so so i i mean um yeah primarily uh, you know eloping so far has been defined as where um, you know the two, two, two people involved uh, uh, the boy and the girl uh, somehow um, scared of confronting parents so either way uh, confronting the girl's parents or confronting and and they just decide to uh, say we are married uh, without uh, and and somehow avoid uh, all the confrontation um but lately i'm also seeing a trend where uh, where uh, there like like it's it's um elope elopement uh, in sort of an understanding way like like everybody knows uh, that uh, these two have been seeing each other and they and and uh, they are um they, they, they i mean they are ready to get married but i don't know maybe to avoid a big wedding uh, to avoid the legalities of stuff they just decide on uh, on eloping uh, but i think um I, uh, something that i'm trying to understand is um when when does a uh, a boy and a girl actually get married is, is it the like after completing the ritual like they walk the aisle and the and they there's a ceremony and the and the pastor or some elder blesses the union it's witnessed by people and then uh, you know the boy and the girl are deemed uh, married or um, or is the boy and the girl uh, you know let's say they they have an understanding and and they just declare themselves like like a couple like if they just uh, you know let's say both believers and and they know they are not supposed to engage in premarital sex but uh, let's say they end up having sex and they say like okay now with this but um, let's just declare ourselves mar- like married And would that be considered as marriage? Uh, I, I'm, I, I'm from the from the word elopement. I'm just scattered all over. But I, I'm I'm looking at what defines elopement and how is it different from what defines marriage? Is it is it the the formal ceremony, the witnessing uh, by the people and the approval by given by the people, the the three uh, announcements of marriage bans that happen in the do all of that comprise? um our marriage or, or is that just been a cultural setting so far and you know we are saying like only when a boy and a girl they do all of these they the marriage bans are announced uh, 
and there's consent from everybody. And then, uh, you know, there's a ceremony or there's a date declared and there's a ceremony. So that is married or, you know, like going back maybe even in Abrahamic times or before. I mean, there's no formal ceremony or I, I don't know, maybe the Jewish are known for having elaborate ceremonies, but can marriage happen without all of these formalities? Uh, and uh, is, is elopement just a word? Uh, the missing of formalities, is it called elopement or, or is there, you know, it's a, that's, that's what I'm uh, wrestling with right now. Thank you. Okay. Anyone has a, a contribution as an answer? Uh, I, I think the other thing to add is that um, there is also this, um, you know, uh, there are registered marriages. So that could also, you know, that doesn't need to have a ceremony. Uh, people that get married because um, sometimes that is required for, you know, for, for, for visas to get, you know, get to another country. So people go in for registered marriages and um, they are, um, uh, you know, um, that could also be another way of, you know, getting married. Uh, or you know, like a court marriage, so it doesn't it doesn't necessarily have any um, uh, anything really to do with elopement uh, specifically, but uh, just thought I'll just add that uh, that aspect of of marriage. Okay, so this is what I I think is um, when we consider marriage <clears throat> as believers. Uh, let's look at the f the way that the first marriage was solemnized. <coughs> Sorry. <clears throat> and uh, we do see how God brought them together. Um, and yes, as a cultural representation, we do it as part of a ceremony where we speak our vows before God as well as follow the cultural and the legal law of the land. Culturally, maybe, you know, bringing people together so that there are witnesses for the union and legally, because it need, either it's a, you know, registered marriage or it is signed or, uh, you know, uh, and that also adds to the law of the land. And all these together are instituted for the safety of the people within the marriage. Um, being before God that is making that commitment and there are witnesses in that, you know, any covenant it has to has to have a witness in it too, right? So, uh, so the, uh, being a covenant relationship in front of God with witnesses and following a specific law of the land is the way that I see you would call somebody married. With, of course, now, now you did mention um, Samuel about, let's say, if there are, if there is sexual relationships that happen prior to marriage, is that considered marriage? In God's word, no, it, it isn't. Uh, because it, it talks, it, it does say, keep the marriage bed honorable. And uh, so we do define marriage, uh, sorry, sex to be within marriage. And maybe in, in, in our culture, we've instituted marriage this way, that for a cultural perspective to have it, maybe in a church or in a community place where you have the witnesses of others um, uh, solemnized by a pastor, so that's, yes, a cultural setting that there is to it. But then there needs to be witnesses just keeping in line with what a covenant relationship should be. I hope I answered your question, Samuel. Yes. And Kennedy. OK. All right. OK, we'll, uh, we'll move on to, I'm at uh, Charles. We are on page uh, 28 of the, of the chapter. We, we've just completed. Uh, <clears throat> part of making a choice. We're going to be looking at a, 
at, at an important part of this question that generally arises that is there this one appointed person for me and where is he or she in the world around and um, how do I find the person okay uh, in order for us to uh, take on some principles of that um, we're going to be reading a portion of scripture uh, I'm on page 28 and 29 um, so could um, there are 15 verses that are here could one person read the first eight yeah. and the other the next uh, um, next seven questions um, so if may would you be okay if I call out a name someone whose voice I haven't heard at all um, to read scripture um, uh, Simran would you like to read the first eight verses please Genesis 24 verses 1 to 8 if you could just unmute uh, that would be helpful 24 Genesis 24 verses 1 to 8. Shrikvart, I'll take your question uh, at the end of the class. Would you kindly note your question, please? Simran? Um, okay, somebody else could read that. Prisi? Prisi, are you on the call? Tracy. Okay, Susan Nirmal, Nirmal, are you on the phone? Yes, ma'am. Yes. yes, could you yes. read? Could you read? Yes, yes. Verses, one, Verses to eight. one to eight. Okay. Genesis 24, chapter 1 to 8, verse. And Abraham was old and well stricken in age, and the Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. And Abraham said unto his eldest servant of his house that ruled all over that, over all that he had, Put, I pray thee, thy hand under my thigh, and I will make thee swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of the earth, that thou shalt not take a wife unto my son of the daughters of the Canaanites among whom I dwell. And thou shalt go unto my country and to my kindred, and take a wife unto my son Isaac. And the servant said unto him, Per adventure the woman will not be willing to follow me unto this land. Must I need bring thy son again unto the land from whence thou came, comes? And Abraham said unto him, Beware thou that bring not my son here again. The Lord God of heaven, which took me from my father's house and from the land of my kindred, and which spake unto me, and that swear unto me, saying, Unto thy seed I will give this land. He shall send his angel before thee, and thou shalt take a wife unto my son from there. And if the woman will not be willing to follow you, then thou shalt be clear from this my oath. Only bring not my son here again. Thank you, Susan. Would someone else like to Just take like over? To... Um, Nisha? Nisha, would you like to read verses 9 to 15? Or uh, Beth, anybody, Beth or Beulah, anyone. Verses 9 to 15. Okay, ma'am, just, just a second, ma'am. I'm going to read. Sure, Beulah, go ahead. So uh, from verse 9. Yeah. Uh, so the servant put his hand under the thigh of Abraham, his master, and swore to him concerning this matter. And the servant took ten of his master's camels and departed, taking some of all his master's treasures with him. Thus he journeyed to Mesop uh, Mesopotamia, between the Tigris and the Euphrates, to the city of Nahor, Abraham's brother. And he made his camels to kneel down outside the city, by a well of water at the time of the evening when the women go out to draw water. And he said, O Lord, God of my master Abraham, I pray you, cause me to meet with good success today and show kindness to my master Abraham. See, I stand here by the well of water 
and the daughters of the men of the city are coming to draw water and let it so be that the girl to whom i say i pray you let down your jar that i may drink and she replies drink and i will give your camels drink also let her be the one whom you have selected and appointed and indicated for your servant isaac to be a wife to him and by it i shall know that you have shown kindness and faithfulness to my master before he had finished speaking behold out came rebecca who was the daughter of bethuel son of milka who was the wife of nahor the brother of abraham with her water jar on her shoulder thank you bula thank you so much okay thank you ma'am so here thank you so here's a a very um um you know setting for an excellent movie isn't it such a uh a uh, excellent um romantic story coming up so when we we're going to be looking at certain insights even as this is one question that is often asked you know is there this one appointed person that god has uh, ordained for me um and uh, uh, you know uh, do i do i continue waiting on so through the scripture this there's some some insights that we'd like to br- bring up so one of the things that we do see is that abraham's servant uh while he went around looking for a person the first thing that we see is he depended on god's guidance and he had a way of seeking the lord for the guidance and he was he had a way of discerning so you know he says that if you look in verse 14 he says see i'm here at this well and let this be something that can that that happened so he does ask god for that guidance and he he prays about it and um th- this is his way of depending on on the guidance so if you if you go back and read that chapter and i will suggest that you go and read that chapter later uh, below you see that the servant abraham's servant is watching rebecca in silence to see whether the guidance that he sought for is happening the way that it is and you know you see that she actually does and she asks gives him the drink and she asks if the camels needed a drink and you also see that you know when that guidance seems to have been fulfilled the servant actually prays and thanks god for the success that he has received okay so one indication is um the guidance that that he received now for us as believers as believers who uh, who exists right now our guidance comes from the practical way we get our guidance is from the holy spirit okay so for us as as believers we uh, understand that the holy spirit is the one who guides us in our spirit to Uh, make certain choices or to be able to find out what is pleasing to the lord or what is acceptable to the lord so one is guidance the second thing that uh, we need to look at it is the the fact that rebecca also could have said no right we see this in genesis um, uh, 24 verse 8 right so in that uh, a, uh, the servant asks you know what if the woman is not willing to come what do i do so abraham says you know you are free of your of you will be free from the promise but don't take my son there if she doesn't come that's fine don't take my son there so we so even in the scripture we see that there is a possibility that Ab- that uh, uh, you know abraham understands that she could have said no the next things think that we see through the through scripture if you read below in genesis 24 verses 49 to 51 when um the servant is invited uh to rebecca's home he uh, you know he he goes and asks the family 
uh, this is in verse um, um, this is in verse 20, uh, 49 uh, she, so she says, verse uh, 49, chapter 24, verse 49, Now if you intend to fulfill your responsibility towards my master and treat him fairly, please tell me. If not, say so, and I will decide what to do. So Abraham's servant goes to uh, Bethuel and tells him, you know, I... I, I need you to need to know if you are willing for this alignment. So there was a possibility even they would could have said no. So in spite of the guidance that he did get, he did go back and check with the family of Rebecca as to what they they were willing to do. So just as much as we may rec we do recognize God's hand, it is also important that you need to get the consent from the people involved either the woman that's involved or uh, you know in this kind of a culture yes it was it was a family that's involved so you know you're not in a place of manipulating the decision and say no god spoke to me that you are the only one right and uh, uh, maybe the person who you think is uh, who you think may be the only one may not think so OK, and that is something that needs to be understood and respected. And so that those are some of the guidelines that we we keep when we say, is there that one and only only one person? We do also see through the story, if you read in, in from verse 54 onwards, um, Rebecca was also asked for her decision. You know, in so Bethuel and uh, Laban says, you know, let's call her and find out what she has to say, and and she was willing to agree. So even ultimately, even Rebecca had to make that choice whether she wanted to say yes or no. So in the same way, uh, you know, there must have been some piece that she had to be to be guided to say to say yes. Um, so these are some of our insights as we understand that 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 even as we we are thinking about what does god desire of us um uh, we believe that there may be potential people who may become partners who come in your life you know potentially i mean there are many young men or men there are many young women in in the place that you are and there can, could be potentially many people but what is it that we need to do to have this guidance is one first and foremost is God's guidance means um, there should be a teaching of the scripture. Are you falling in line with what scripture teaches? Are they in the Lord? That's the, the biggest um, the first thing that you, you you need to look into is there the inner witness of the Holy Spirit now when when you're interacting with this person or when you're considering someone is there a witness from the from the person um, what do what is the advice of, of maybe family or godly members what are the circumstances that you may be married in? now now for example if you say the one appoint the one and only appointed one for me is that person who seems to be married that's not in your circumstance right and that's not something that that god desires he will he will not do something that is contrary to his word there could be even certain desires of your heart like you said you know there are certain expectations that you may have and you say okay these people fit the fit it and that's again one and of course um, uh, lastly is the agreement or the willingness of the person that is involved. So when, so while you are doing the seeking, um, you're not really uh, trying to find the the one and only person, but the person that you may recognize as the one God is guiding you to, and that really determines who is the best suitable one for you. So not looking for, okay, which is this appointed one, but God may be guiding you through this one, through these essential factors we spoke about, you know, the teaching of scripture, having the witness of the Holy Spirit, maybe advice of people around, the consent of the person involved, the, 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 um, the expectations and the desires of your heart. Uh, and of course, uh, lastly, we said, you know, the circumstances that may be involved. So these are, that's how you seek for a partner. So we may not really 
we do not believe that there could be just one appointed one, but the one that you choose with God's guidance, with the witness of the Holy Spirit, becomes that one person for you, becomes the spouse for the rest of your life. So all because the person you thought was the appointed one got married to somebody else, uh, that does not mean that they are in, uh, you know, in, in, in a wrong place or neither are you in a wrong place. The decision also needs to be mutual. So if God is speaking to them, God will, will also speak to you. And you can never force a person to uh, assume hearing um, uh, and believing what, what God has probably spoken to you. So would that mean that you do not have a great marriage if you think the appointed one has gone? Uh, you know, like we said, marriage is not about finding the right person or the Mr. Perfect. It's about uh, daily, on, a, on an everyday basis, building your marriage into a relationship as God wanted you to be. So it is to know that God will fulfill the purpose for your life as long as the one you have been married has been guided to. You've been guided to make that decision, keeping some of these factors in mind. Okay, I know this opens out, usually this opens up a lot of uh, uh, discussions. So I'm, I'm taking the next maybe five minutes to, to see if anyone does have a question. Okay, I think there are a couple of questions here. Okay, if we believe in a one and only spouse, how can we reconcile remarriage after death of a spouse? Okay, so we do not believe in a one and only spouse, Beth. I think that's what we were trying to, I hope I've answered that question as I've spoken. Beth, uh, Abraham, your question was, Pastor, it means God can tell you this woman is your wife, but the woman can say no, or you can miss her because you did not tell her early. Okay. Um, Okay, so I, I think I want to bring about two things over here. Uh, how do I label it? But let's say something like a, and a, like a like a general guidance is, you know, you look into scripture. <clears throat> you have the inner witness of the Holy Spirit. Uh, you have your circumstances, uh, you know, right. You have those expectations or desires that you've had seen. Um, you've had consent. Okay, this we will look at uh, normal guidance. Guidance. Let's say something as there. There can be cases where there can be what is a good word? Supernormal, extra normal. I mean, wrong word to use. But what I mean to say is something beyond normal. Okay a different kind or, a, or an extraordinary or extra normal, whatever, uh, guidance where God may, in some cases, tell you that there is this one person. And why that happens? Uh, because I, I know that it, okay, supernatural. All right. Thank you, Rose. Yeah. So maybe a supernatural guidance where uh, God has shown you one specific person, maybe to fulfill a specific purpose um, in your life or in their lives. And without that, it wouldn't happen. But I'd say that may not be something that is probably normal. And uh, uh, and th there could be that, that sense where it could be, you know, um, a, a sense of su supernatural, where there's that extraordinary guidance about who you need to marry. And it, that could be like a direct con communication from God so that you know um, uh, and, and this, like I see, it may not happen that frequently, but God does give that kind of guidance precisely because a decision about who you are to marry is very important or can have an impact for your specific future. So yes, that can happen, but I don't, I, I don't think that's always the way that it works. So God does give you, like, like for example, the job to take. You know, um, there may be certain factors contingent factors that you have in mind and you may take that you may have three or four of it you may decide god i'm taking this one right so similarly you may have three or four proposals and as you see you do see that all of this fits into your factors god's guided you to that and you take that on and live on, on that okay uh so i so yeah so that's uh so that's that yes or can you miss her because you did not tell her early um, i mean it Again, I think this is also cultural where you can approach a person who you feel God is leading you to uh, like this, like like just like in the story, but be willing to take no for an answer and graciously walk out of the door. 
right? Um, I think there's been one more question by Charles. What about those who say you're the one I was made to marry, and if you marry another one, I will never marry? What is your stand? Um, I think that's that's being probably rebellious when when someone who has refused uh, your proposal because they feel that God has called them otherwise is uh, uh, and and you want to stick on in obedience in in uh, in wanting that and only that maybe you should go back and ask God you know was I being in a rebellious streak or um, you know or what do I do do I do I uh, do I decide as to whether I want to seek and pursue God? Remember, uh, we had spoken about this, and I think it's coming further on in the chapter, that if you decide not to marry, the decisions should be mainly because you want to do something for God's kingdom, that you will be more effective being single and and um, following God and serving God. And not because someone didn't marry you, someone who you felt should have married you shouldn't marry you. So I think that uh, is not um, in obedience to what God would want you to do. Okay, that's uh, then I think Prabhakar's asked a question: How do we recognize if the person is superficial or real in the compatibility? Okay, um, a lot by interactions. We do know how people are by their interactions always good to do background checks and that's something that is needed even um, and and I think that's something very uh, I think very positive about the culture that I am in <clears throat> that when <clears throat> when a person is bought or you know when there is an alliance that is bought about there is a lot of time taken to understand the the setting or the lifestyle or the culture or the working or the character of the person by finding out further details you know you you call um uh, you you call the the pastor you call the church you call people within the city and you know so there's a lot of background check that that needs to be done that you are able to recognize if there is genuineness uh, in the person. So doing that is very, very helpful. And uh, especially marriages, I I, I, I do um, vehemently stand against marriages that take place within a week or two. You know, someone finds someone and then say, okay, let's get married. Uh, you need to spend time, uh, judge, know, research, um, pray, for guidance, be able able to see what God's leading you to. Because I, I've seen the power, I think I, I don't know if I mentioned this the last time, but I do see the power of prayer even, uh, you know, before marriages take place. I remember, um, you know, this one couple where uh, things were ready. The couple was to be married at a particular week, the week before uh, we prayed together, and very strangely, I prayed this prayer. I said, God, if this is not something you have desired, <clears throat> you know, close this door. I generally don't pray that. You know, when when a couple is all ready to get married, they've got their clothes and dress and their lives planned out. Uh, praying a prayer like that can be a very scary thing. But uh, I don't know. I think I was just led by the Spirit to pray that. And the day before the wedding that marriage was called off due to some issue you know but prayer praying for for that is uh, very very important okay all right i think uh, charles you had a follow up question pastor they end up committing suicide beca because they refuse to mar marry them is not that lust uh, yes that's lust and probably selfishness and everything added together so that can be that is first and foremost an indication that the person is emotionally unstable that if there has been a um, refusal they are unable to emotionally handle uh, a difficult situation so there you have your warning sign then there and then that that is a relationship that could head in for trouble you know if people 
Now, I, I've, I've seen people, you know, wanting to cut themselves, threatening to, to die, threatening to not stay married. These are all emotionally immature responses. And these are some ways that you understand that. Okay. Charles, your question was, how long was the servant of Abraham at Rebecca's and did Isaac date her? Was their courtship? <laughs> <clears throat> I don't think the the uh, fact of courtship was even was ever even there. But the Jewish wedding, as as far as that we read it, there is a sense of <clears throat> there's that sense of uh, time between the betrothal and the and the wedding ceremony in itself. So in probably in that culture, maybe you know, even as Rebecca reached back home, maybe there was a sense of preparation that they both had to do till the time that they were they were married. Uh, how long was the servant of Abraham at Rebecca's? I have no idea. You know, he stayed there for a day, right? So probably a day or two, maybe. And that's I, I'm just inferring. I don't know. Does anyone else have any other answer on that? And did Isaac date her? You know, dating is a... Dating is a... Yes, Hope, you have an answer. Yeah, the answer is no, ma'am. Sorry, did you say we also don't know? Is that what you said? Yeah, the answer is no, no. Yeah, okay, right. Yeah, so um, uh, Charles, dating is, is something that uh, has come in you know, I think in the last probably, if I'm not mistaken, 7,500 years, and there was no concept of dating in biblical times. Uh, so I'm sure Isaac didn't date her. Isaac may have seen her. You see the way that she, you know, he, she gets off the camel, um, you know, asks for the master, and that was it. And, and then uh, dating versus wooing. Must have, I'm sure. Uh, I mean, how many of you men decided to woo your, woo your to be wives? Okay, uh, Rupa, you have a question, Rupa. <coughs> I just uh, I wanted to share. It's in 54th verse. It says that he woke up. We just spent a night there, and he woke up in the morning and said, "Send me away to my master." So it just. Yeah. It was just a night, correct. Yeah, so that's what I said. Yeah, it was a day. Okay. Uh, your question was, but Joseph and Mary were doing what before Jesus was born? Mm. Okay. So they, they again, uh, um, I think we need to understand the meaning of dating. Okay, they were betrothed to be married. married remember? They were, but they were not dating. They, the, the, they were betrothed. Joseph was betrothed to be married. So that was, uh, it was like, uh, like a committed or a known thing that he would be married to her. So that was not dating. That was maybe courtship. And uh, yeah, so definitely not dating. Um, I hope I answered that, Charles. Uh, the next question, Christopher, in the Bible, divorce is permitted because of adultery and abandonment. Please explain abandonment in more detail with examples. Okay, so some of the examples of abandonment comes uh, when Paul is talking about um, uh, the unbelieving spouse. Okay, so it says, uh, I'll have to find scripture. Just give me a minute. Just looking up uh, the scripture for that. So it says in uh, in Corinthians. Uh, I think it's First Corinthians seven. Yeah, First Corinthians seven, chap uh, chapter seven, verse thirteen. It says, um, "If a if a woman, 
if a woman has a husband who is not a believer and he is willing to live with her, she must not divorce him. Um, for the unbelieving wife brings holiness to her marriage and the believing husband brings holiness to his marriage. Otherwise, your children would not be holy. But now they are holy. Sorry, I'm just trying to get the entire of the uh, scripture. Just a minute. My app is not opening. Okay, so verse 11 and 12, okay? Um, uh, sorry, 10. So now for those who are married, I have a command that comes not from me, but from the Lord. A wife must not leave her husband. But if she does leave him, let her remain single or else go back to him. And the husband must not leave his wife. Now I will speak to the rest of you, though I do not. Okay, so, so that's where it says, uh, you know, that those who are married, uh, the command is to, to be with him. But if she does leave him, let her remain single or else go back to him. So the, the fact of uh, in, in a place of where there is a partner who is not a believer uh, and there is abandonment, uh, and if they leave, the, you know, that's, that's the only point, point of place where it talks about abandonment, that if they choose not to be with the partner as a result of um, maybe uh, unbelief, then that's the only place where it talks about uh, divorce. Right? Uh, okay. Pastor? Yes, yeah. sorry. Yes, Manji, yes. I have a, yes. I have a follow-up question on that question, uh, or that right. answer. Um, the Bible said that, uh, God said that we should not divorce in any mm -hmm. case, except except when there's a bad case. Uh, why would Paul say, why would Paul say that? Because before that he said, God said, if, if you, a wife separated with her husband, she should go back to her husband. Or if her husband separated with his wife, should not marry, she go back to, to his wife. So why would he say, why would he, would he go contrary to, to the word of God? Because he said that it's not the God who said it, it is his, he, his own ideas, his own mind. It's not Paul, it is God's. Uh, it, it's not God, it's Paul saying that. Yeah, so, so what he's saying that marriage needs to be looked reverentially, but his recommendations are there are certain special circumstances of maybe, let's say, a difficult time. So um, the, the, the concept of marriage is the wedding of two souls. Um, and if, if an unbelieving husband leaves, you, you should stay with him if he's willing to stay. But if not, if he abandons, uh, it says then it may be better to stay that way it's it's okay it's it's to stay that way but if he returns live with him so he uh, paul is giving uh an uh, a choice of a not a choice paul is giving the options of what could happen if it were on these two terms one term when the person leaves uh, being not being in a sanctified marriage and who's not as yoked as a believer, if he leaves, what what is possible that can be done and what if he doesn't. But at the end, he also says it's a good thing for people to be together. You know, if they are willing to stay, that's a good thing. That is something that we should keep, keep uh, uh, sanctified and keep in the system within marriage. That's what Paul's saying. I hope I answered that. Thank you, Pastor. Yeah. yeah. Thank okay. you, Pastor. Um, I think there was some more question. Uh, Rose said, I have a very long question. It's regarding a situation of a friend who is overseas and her husband left at home country with their children. 
uh, okay, she is really distressed with the decision she's about to make, though God made her a promise from his word. Okay. Um, uh, I don't know if you want me to take this up here, Rose, or not. Because you said you could take it up in the stream. Yeah, uh, I can write you on the stream, Pastor. Okay. All right. Okay. Thank you. Um, right. Uh, so there's one more question here. Is it true that engagement in those days was considered as good as marriage breaking it was also not considered good? Yes, so a betrothal actually meant a lot more that there was a it was uh, it was a commitment to um, to two things. One is a sense of building up responsibilities and also, um, to uh, uh, to prove your purity, you know, to prove that you you are purified uh, or your purity. So these were two things that were considered during an engagement that the that the person that the people involved in the marriage would be one preparing themselves. Like I said, you know, we had spoken about that how in a Jewish culture the groom goes and prepares a place. Uh, we had spoken of how you know it's an analogy that we see in the same way that Jesus goes to prepare a place to bring back his bride and the bride stays uh, pure and sanctified in him as we await that wedding banquet, right? So in that similar way, um, uh, it, it was something that was, that was meant to be kept uh, sanctified. And that's why you see <coughs> that uh, Joseph and Mary, Joseph wanted to secretly, um, uh, you know, call off the wedding, but uh, because in order not to bring Mary public disgrace, so uh, and also in the culture, Jewish culture, uh, an adulterous woman could be stoned, right? So, being in engagement meant that you had to prove your yourself to be to be pure. So breaking it was definitely also. Uh, uh, for what reason would definitely have been um, uh, a concern, right? Okay, all right. So um, we will. Uh, I think if that. Thank you, thank you, Tarun, for bringing up that scripture. Yes, uh, it is not contrary. It's the same what Jesus said in Matthew. Yes, that's right. Yes, it is right. Okay, I hope there are, are there any questions? If not, we will wrap up. Uh, I just have one question. Yes, Vila. Uh, like, I, I'm just thinking here, ma'am, like, uh, yeah, we're discussing about making the choice and divinely led and all of that um, from our perspective, mm -hmm. probably the natural. But mm -hmm. I'm also thinking here that I, for me, I strongly feel that marriages are uh, God ordained and orchestrated, because as we see the um, the scenario in uh, uh, Isaac's marriage case, like we see how uh, Abraham says the angel of the Lord goes before, uh, um, like you know the servant, and like the rest of the story, we just see how everything is like orchestrated by God. Like he goes there, he meets Rebecca. He could have met <coughs> any other person, uh, like. I don't know, in my th thinking, I'm just seeing here, like, God really orchestrates every circumstance and situation for us to meet the right person. Because what I'm thinking is after marriage, like marriage is like, yes, we the marriage is there, the relationships, we need to work on all of that stuff. But the most important part of the marriage would be the next generation, like the children who come from the marriage. So according to the scriptures, we see that every child like carries a destiny. So if that child has to come to being, the right parents have to come together. Because the child comes from these two parents, like, and the child carries a destiny. And the child has a purpose, because that's what the scripture says, that each one of us have a destiny. And that God has written about us, like, in that book, even the days of our, uh, like, you know, the... Uh, the number of our days have been planned, like the book of Psalms says, like, and God says, like, I knew you even before you were formed in the mother's womb. So when we look at this part of the scriptures, we see that God already knew us before we were formed in the mother's womb, meaning like everything was orchestrated by God. 
so uh, how do we just put all of these things together or connect these dots to understand um the the whole thing about the man and the woman coming together in the marriage and the purpose of god on the marriage and the purpose of the children that come out of the marriage the destiny they uh, the 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 carry like does it not all connect back to god orchestrations in a person's marriage okay so uh, i think your question is meaning to ask that if god has orchestrated something but we make our own choice we don't fall in the orchestration of god is that what your question is meaning to ask yes and also i feel like is it is it possible that somebody gets out of that god orchestrations and make decisions in a marriage or does it is it all divinely planned and orchestrated so okay to to maybe there are two parts to this so the first one yes. is one you said does uh, when god orchestrates something and we move out of that and make your own decisions so the key to knowing that god has guided you into something is clear that we fall in line with scripture that we are led by the holy spirit to make a decision that way right and when we when we are submit to that that guidance submit to what we see has been you know these these certain factors that we submitted it to the lord we trust that god is leading us to what he has willed for us we trust that okay and we believe that even in those circumstances god will do everything that he needs to give you godly children to build those destiny in those specific children who god is going to give as a result of that union all of that will be in that uh, in in that line um like like you said you know sometimes we may fall out of god's plan for our lives all of us even as believers maybe in your journey prior you would have seen how you've probably fallen out of god's plan that does not mean god changes his plan god's plan for us is is always on track and it does not change depending on what we do or what we do not do but he calls us and brings us back into the plan of god and when he does Ma'am, that uh, sorry to interrupt you yeah and like what i'm thinking is okay if it is concerning a job or just moving to a certain place there is a there is a, the uh, the chance of a person making a mistake and falling out of the plan but this marriage is something i i feel is the most important thing in a person's life because mm-hmm. it brings out the generations it's not just about the two people but the generations that are going to follow because biblically when we see abram had to come together with sarah to bring isaac isaac had to come together with rebecca to bring forth jacob and esau and likewise mm. the lineage of esau is not been told much but the god's destiny and plan in bringing out the nation of israel like they had to come jacob had to come together like this to with alia and rachel only so that he brings forth this 12 so i'm i'm what i'm trying to say here is is this lot the marriage like god ordained that because it's not just about the two people because it's going mm-hmm. to be about the generations and coming forth and the plan of god and the destiny of god because when we see biblically only when these things happened the 12 tribes of israel came into bring being and out of the 12 tribes came jesus the messiah like we see everything was like orchestrated so i'm really thinking here like some uh, things like yeah we may fall out of the plan of god like choosing a job or choosing a house or whatever but when it comes to marriage is it not like it is god ordained could it be like it's outside of it does it happen that way okay so you you bought about an excellent example when you said about uh, 
uh, sorry, I'm just charging my, my thing as I'm talking. So you brought about an excellent example about, um, you know, the people involved uh, in, in, in the birth of the Messiah. So when you look at the genealogy of, uh, um, of what is written there, you will see the names of very many people who wouldn't actually fit into, uh, you know, the bloodline of a king. So if you look at uh, Matthew, you will see that the names that are written there are Rahab, um, Bathsheba, uh, Ruth, and all of these, as you see, are Gentiles. They were Gentiles who were willing and who decided to follow uh, the Lord's... Sorry, just, sorry, just give me a minute. Yeah, sorry, who were willing to follow God and be guided by him. And he chose even the imperfect people within that bloodline to come about and bring about a Messiah. So when you see that, when you see that genealogy, you do see the imperfect people. Look at Judah and Tamar. Um, you know, one of Ju uh, Judah's, uh, it's, it's out of that, uh, you know, the, the kind of people that were there in it all had faulty uh, characters, but yet God's purpose was fulfilled. So when we do see this in the bloodline of Jesus, how much more hope do we have that when God guides us into something, he has... Uh, you know, he he has already had his purposes, and I want to I want to read a verse for you. Uh, this is in Philippians chapter two, verse thirteen. So it says, "For it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill His good purpose." So when you commit a specific choice of a marriage partner, it is God who works in you to will and to act in order that he will fulfill that good purpose in you. You can trust that. You can absolutely believe that when you ask the Lord for guidance, when you ask him for, uh, you know, to lead you to a particular person um, and and maybe not have that supernatural guidance as, as, as we were talking about, he will work in you to will and to act according to his good purpose. This is in Philippians 2.13. I hope I've answered your question in short. Uh, Samuel, did you have yes, a response? Yeah. Did you, you have a response to that, Samuel? Uh, you had raised your arm up. Yes, yes, thank you, ma'am. Yes, I think uh, one one practical way of, um, um, like I was trying to understand Beulah's question, so I think practically what I was understanding was, uh, you know, uh, what if God wants me to marry, like God has already ordained someone for, to, for me to get married. And out of our marriage, you know, there are, there's a generation that's coming up and God has uh, destiny and, and purposes for those generations and all of that. So God has ordained some, someone for me to get married. But uh, what if I uh, disobey uh, uh, and make my own choice and fall out of God's plan and marry someone of my choice? You know, then will, uh, will what God has ordained for me, like especially in terms of the offsprings to come and and the other uh, fulfillment of purposes for my life and for my for my marriage will will that be flawed will that uh, will that that not take place because i i disobeyed uh, god so probably you know like what if isaac instead of marrying rebecca uh, married someone else uh, married uh, didn't wait for uh, Abraham's servant to go and get, but you know, or or, or like even practically in today, like I think uh, that was what I was trying to. I mean, about that was the picture that I was kind of getting uh, from the last question, and and you you kind of answered it that even if we do make wrong choices, they, there will be a lot of pain and suffering that will come with that. But but God God's plan doesn't change. He will eventually even out of the mistake that we've made. And go, and if we just go back to God and, and surrender our lives, uh, even the mistake that we've made, God will correct that and, and, and bring about uh, His will for us. Uh, Thank you. Thank you, Samuel. Bula, I hope uh, you've, you've got the answer. Um, if not, you could, you know, chat back on the stream and we could take it up for further discussion or even bring it back next week. Thank you so much. Uh, as always, you, enjoy. Buddy. Uh, let's let's close with a word of prayer. Um, may I ask uh, or any one person uh, to pray? Uh, Abhishek, would you like to close with a word of prayer, please? Abhishek Mitra. 
ओके मैम ओके मैम थैंक यू लॉर्ड जीसस वी कम बिफोर योर प्रेजेंस थैंक यू फॉर द टीचिंग थैंक यू फॉर द गाइडेंस थैंक यू फॉर द टीचर एंड थैंक यू फॉर ऑल द गुड थिंग वी टुडे वी लर्न from uh, from the subject marriage and family thank you god for this teaching lord we need this kind of teaching lord uh, for to prepare us for the future thank you for the goodness and i also pray for bless the teacher ma'am uh, with your spirit of understanding and revelation that uh, in next week we learn more about this the subject and bless all the student Thank you for uh, hearing our prayer. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, Abhishek. Thank you, everybody. Have a blessed week ahead. We will meet next week. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you so much.